I am Dustin Abbott, and I'm here today to give you the second of a series of reviews of some brand new releases from Sigma, in that at the same time, they announced both a 20 millimeter F1.4 DN art series lens for full frame mirrorless cameras in either Sony FE full frame E mount or Leica L mount, which I, if you missed that review, you can see linkage to it here. They also re released and announced and have now released a 24 millimeter F1.4 uh, DG, DG DN art series lens. Now, that may cause some of you to say, hey, wait a minute, wasn't there already a 20 millimeter, 24 millimeter f1.4 art series lens on Sony? And the answer to that is yes. And I actually reviewed that lens back in 2018. However, it was part of a group of lenses that Sony sent, or excuse me, Sigma essentially ported over for Sony. And what I mean by that is that while you are already able to successfully adapt Sigma lenses via their MC11 mount converter adapter, in this case, what Sigma did is basically built that right into the lenses and refined the process a little bit more. As a byproduct, it essentially was the DSR lens with an adapter built in to port it to use on autofocus with autofocus and the functionality of on mirrorless cameras. But those lenses were compromised from day one. Compromised in that rather than becoming more compact as they came to mirrorless, they actually grew because they had to move the optical path forward, make room for that adapter. And, uh, and so as a byproduct, they grew in size and weight and they were already big lenses to begin with and became even more so in that process. On average, usually about 110 grams heavier and anywhere uh, around anywhere close to 20 millimeters longer in length. Not a good formula. So what Sigma has since done is they have begun releasing what they designate as DN lenses. DN lenses are those that are specifically designed for use on mirrorless. And they've done a really good job on that platform. Even when it comes to DN lenses, however, this is the third of the 24 millimeter DN lenses that they have released, starting with a 24 millimeter F3.5, very, very small lens, and then a medium uh, 24 millimeter F2 lens, and now, the high performing GM challenging 24 millimeter F1.4 DN art series lens. This, if you are into professional grade photography and you are looking for a 24 millimeter lens that offers up all the performance of the G Master, but at a lower price point, this is probably the lens that you have been waiting for. And we're gonna detail why as a part of our review today. But first, a word from our sponsor. Today's episode is brought to you by Phantom Wallet, the minimalist modern wallet that is now even better with the new Phantom X that is crafted from aluminum right here in Canada. It is 22% smaller and 35% lighter, while still making it easy to access your cards and money when you need them, thanks to their unique fanning mechanism. You could even customize your wallet due to its modular design, with accessories like a money clip, cash holder, ID display, and even Chipolo and AirTag tracking integration. Visit store.phantomwallet.com to check out their unique sizes, styles, and finishes that span from aluminum to wood to carbon fiber. And use code DUSTIN15 for 15% off when you're ready to check out. Now, as I noted in our introduction, that previous version of this lens was already compromised in that it started with a large lens and it became larger still. And about the time that uh, Sigma released that lens, the Sony G Master lens had come out just a little bit before that. And the 24 uh, millimeter F1.4 G Master was kind of the beginning of what I consider to be a Sony golden age of their G Master lenses, in which it started off a series of just one home run after another. But the 24 millimeter F1.4 1.4 GM was kind of the first of that series in that it was compact, very high performing optically, feature rich, just a great lens in general. Well, that Sigma lens, while it undercut the, the Sony in price, it was some 73% uh, heavier than what the G Master lens was. And in fact, in terms of the overall size, that ported lens, by my measurements and my weight, it was 126 millimeters in length and weighed in at a fairly whopping 768 grams. This new lens is much smaller, 97 millimeters in length, only five millimeters longer than the GM lens, and weighs in at 510 grams, or roughly about 50 grams heavier than what the G Master does. But as before, it is undercutting the G Master in price and it is improved in every fa facet. And that most definitely comes to the build, handling, and the features of the lens. Let's dive in and take a look at what is new and improved here. 
The new 20 millimeter and 24 millimeter f1.4 DN lenses from Sigma are really, uh, I would say, probably the most feature rich lenses that Sigma has ever made in this category of lens. Uh, they're just, there's a lot of different things that we'll break down as a part of it. So, quickly, let's just talk about some of the features that are there. Starting with aperture, you have got so many options when it comes to how you're going to control your aperture. Now, for those of you that just like going all the way into your, um, your aperture automatic mode where you just want to control from in camera, you've got that option. You just switch into the automatic mode. If you want to make sure that you never uh, ap accidentally move the aperture ring and uh, cause that to change aperture, you have a switch over here on the side that will either lock you into automatic mode, so now there is no aperture ring, or if you're someone who doesn't want to slip accidentally into automatic mode and you want to manually control, you can also hit that lock and it will keep you from going over into the automatic mode. And so that makes your new aperture limit at F16. And so obviously that's going to be handy. You also have an option when it comes to whether you're going to have a clicked or a declicked aperture. There's a switch here on the side. And so now you can have either the aperture in one third stop to tenths with very nicely defined clicks there. Or if you go to the declicked, those of you that want to do aperture racking for video, you can see that I am able to smoothly rack through the various aperture values to achieve that. You also have an AF-MF switch, always useful. You've got a focus hold button, which can be programmed to a variety of functions. And then an interesting feature that really is, I think, designed mostly around, um, you know, astrophotography or some other situation where you want to set a focus point and then make sure it's not bumped from. You can actually have a focus lock here. And so whatever focus position has been preserved, let's say if you've manually focused uh, to get to perfect focus point for going out to shoot the night sky and you don't want to have to do that again in the dark, you can lock that and so even if there is movement on the actual focus ring it's going to keep that exact focus position as you had before. I also know that as far as focus goes that this is compatible with Sony's focus assist um, if you're familiar with that function for video capture. And so when it comes to the basic functions that are here in the lens, there's a lot going on there. On top of that, we've got the nice lens hood with a lock, a rubberized transition, a textured grip. It's a very well-made lens hood that is an obvious cut above what I often see. We've got traditional filter threads up front in a you know fairly common 72 millimeter uh, size. We also have a rear filter holder, and so you have a lot of uh, focus options, and this is um, you know, a nicely designed system where you can actually lock a filter into place. And uh, if you get filters, and I've reviewed filter systems before for rear, rear filters that will work well with something like this. There also is a weather sealing as a part of the lens with a gasket here and some internal seals inside. So all of that is nice as well. They've also designed this to where, um, and I'm not really familiar with using this function, but they do advertise that those of you that like to use a heater, uh, maybe shooting in certain conditions where you want to keep condensation from coming on, it does have a lip that is designed to support that uh, heater, and so it's not obscuring into the, um, the actual image itself and causing issues related to that. Now, to give you a breakdown of the size, this is the most compact of the F1.4 DN primes in this series. And so it is uh, 75.7 millimeters in diameter and uh, 97.5 millimeters in overall length. So that's three inches by 3.8 inches in terms of the diameter itself. The weight comes in at 510 grams or 18 ounces. And so it is significantly smaller and lighter than what the previous version was of the Art Series lens. We've got an 11 bladed aperture iris that keeps a nice circular shape, as you can see but also it gives you unique 22 pointed sunburst or sun stars uh, as well. Our minimum focus distance here is 25 centimeters or 9.9 .9 inches and giving you a ratio of 1 to 7.1 which comes out to a little over 0.14 times magnification. And so we've got a variety of functions built into this lens, very, very feature rich, and I haven't used any lens including a G Master that has more in terms of features. So obviously some huge step forwards when it comes to the build and the handling of the lens where we've got all of the features plus some when you compare it to the G Master. 
And I think that there is nothing that is lost here when it comes to autofocus performance as well. Sigma has utilized an STM or stepping motor here, and while there is some variability in the performance of stepping motors, this is one of the better ones. It is smooth, it is quiet, it is very fast in operation. In fact, in doing focus pulls, they're very quick, snappy, confident, and zero sound associated with them. Uh, there is some focus breathing that you'll see as a part of that. And then, of course, the ability to do aperture racking is a feature that does compare it to the G Master lens. And as you can see, you can smoothly rack through those apertures for video purposes as well. IAF works perfectly fine in that I was able to track both human and animal eyes without any kind of issue. Though as with any wider angle lens, uh, you're going to get more of the active tracking in terms of what you see on screen when the subject is close to the camera and the eye occupies a large enough portion of the frame for IAF to truly be active. But I think that what kind of stood out with me with both of these lenses is that they were really effortless to use when it came to autofocus. When I was out in the field and I was shooting a variety of different images, I just didn't even have to work to get them. Autofocus was quick, it was intuitive, whether I was shooting at very large apertures, even very fine depth of field, you know, narrow depth of field shots, or if I was shooting at smaller apertures. And, you know, one of the things that I did see sometimes on the GM is that at smaller apertures, I, did, I could get a little bit of pulsing in some situations, which hopefully has been improved proved via firmware since that point. But I did note that as a part of my GM review. I didn't see any of that with this Sigma. It just did the job. No fuss, no muss. It just got things done. So high marks when it comes to that. I also noted that when I did my review of the original 24mm f1.4 art, it was one of the earlier uh, art series lenses going back to its release date, coming you know fairly early in the cycle, not long after the 35mm f1.4. And what I noted even back in 2018 is that uh, Sony had, or excuse me, Sigma had come so far in their art series in terms of just performance in so many ways. That lens, optically, it was still good, but it was not exceptionally good in that the center was strong, the corners much weaker, and it had some other optical flaws that I highlighted as a part of my review. As you can see from this MTF chart, there is some significant improvement across the frame in performance, and that really bears out when I did my optical test. Let's dive in and let's take a look at that optical performance together. So we'll start by taking a look at vignette and distortion. This is an uncorrected raw image here on the left, and as you can see, really neither thing is overly bad here. There's very, very little distortion at all, and a vignette is not particularly heavy. I've done a manual correction here on the right side. Now, I will note that Sigma lenses do receive very good corrections in camera for video and JPEGs, so this will all be dealt with in camera and, of course, good profile support in software. I've manually corrected mostly so I can demonstrate what's actually being corrected here. And so if we take a look, I have a plus three that you can see has delivered a nicely corrected result. Uh, there's no linear, it's a linear distortion. So there's no mustache pattern, anything that is unusual there. Uh, vignette is roughly two stops in the corner, nothing severe there. And so I could correct with a plus 49, moving the mid midpoint over. So no issue on that front. Now, I found that there were less longitudinal chromatic aberrations with the 24 millimeter than what there are on the 20 millimeter. Not that they were bad there, but you can see that on our subject here, um, there's very little uh, like fringing to be seen as we go out of focus, just very minor. And if we look towards some of these bokeh circles, there's a tiny bit of like a greenish fringing there, but it is so muted as to be a basic non-issue. Uh, here's another shot here where you can see, once again, on the subject, there's some, you know, high contrast transition areas there. Very little fringing to be seen. Looking into the bokeh circles, a little bit more of that green fringing, slightly more pronounced here, but uh, nothing severe either. One final image on this note where I'm looking more at, you know, something that's very light with contrast areas. And so you can see on this goat's beard weed here that, number one, I mean, detail looks fabulous. And the amount of fringing that is there as we move out of focus is really, really minimal. So this is something that's really well controlled on this lens. Likewise, I didn't see anything that uh, concern me when it comes to lateral chromatic aberrations near the edge of the frame. You can see the tiniest bit of fringing on these very high contrast areas of the bare branches, but nothing really to take note of. And uh, again, this is the kind of chromatic aberrations, even if they did exist, are very easily correctable with just one click. 
So taking a look at our resolution results, this is on the 50 megapixel Sony Alpha 1. We're taking a look at 200% magnification. Now you can see looking at the MTF chart that the MTF from the original 24 millimeter f1.4 art has been improved on, not as dramatically as with the 20 millimeter, but definitely uh, some improvements, particularly seen in the mid frame and then off to the corner. You can just see that it's a more consistent performance. If we took a look, take a look here at resolution at 200% magnification. You can see in the center of the frame it looks exceptional. Not as exceptional as the 20 millimeter, but very, very strong. Mid frame um, also looking really, really good at uh, 24, excuse me, at f1.4. And off into the corner, we can see it does drop off a little bit more than the 20 millimeter towards the edge of the frame, which is what the MTF charts suggest, but it is still a nice looking performance. So if we take that out into the real world, comparing f1.4 to f5.6 at just 100% magnification, we can see that there is more visible contrast on the f5.6. In the center of the frame, however, you know, it's already looking excellent. As we pan towards the edge of the frame, there is a little bit more obvious difference in the contrast in particular between f5.6 and f1.4. And obviously depth of field is going to be a factor here. Now we can see that there is a little bit more of, you know, uh, I would say some coma that we'll look at a little bit later on that is showing hipper on the edge of the frame at f1.4 that is obviously, you know, perfectly controlled by f5.6. Depth of field obviously is going to be the bigger factor on the foreground here, which is not in focus at f1.4. Now the mild stop down to f1.8 does provide a little bit more of a, um, noticeable improvement than what I saw in the 20 millimeter lens. You can see the contrast even in the center of the frame uh, really picks up in that little bit of stop down to f1.8. Likewise in the mid frame you can just see that the uh, contrast results are stronger with the image being brighter looking there. Now the mild stop down from f1.4 to f1.8 produces a more obvious um, improvement here than what I saw on the 20 millimeter lens. A contrast is you know definitely improved even in the center of the frame. In the mid frame it's a little bit more mild but you can see that the brighter areas are more obvious and there's just a little bit more crispness to the textures. Down here in the corner however it's a much more obvious improvement where uh, we can see much better contrast and detail and we can also see that there's less of a drop off as you get towards the corner of the frame. Stopping on down to f2 gives us a little bit more contrast but the biggest jump comes here between f2 and f2.8 where you can see that now the corners have become exceptionally sharp at f2.8 all the way out. If we turn back to the center of the frame, the center of the frame, you, you can see a noticeable difference even there in that the contrast is better. But again, if we move off towards the edges of the frame, it's a little bit more of an obvious improvement. From f2.8 to f4, there is uh, still more improvement to where we're getting into exceptional territory here, um, at even at the corner of the frame. And you're going to see a more mild uh, returns as you go from f4 to f5.6. I do think there's slightly more contrast, but you wouldn't be able to tell this difference without the two images side by side. Our minimum aperture is f16, and the effects of diffraction on my high-resolution Sony Alpha 1 uh, have started to negatively impact the image quality. You can just see some reduction in contrast, though in this case f16 is not a particularly small maximum aperture, and so I do think that it could still be usable if your overall goal is more to have as much in focus as possible. Uh, under most conditions, I recommend kind of capping at f11 as the max or the minimum aperture that I would recommend and using. Now at our minimum focus distance, the magnification is just a little over 0.14 times, so not quite as high, about two points lower than what we saw on the 20 millimeter, but a byproduct is you're not having, you're not quite as close when focusing, and so it does produce a little flatter plane of focus. I also find that the detail and contrast is a little bit better with the lens up close, and, and so while it's not an exceptionally high magnification figure, I do find that the up close results are very usable. Actually, I really liked this lens uh, in use in more shallow depth of field situations because it does a great job of compromising between exceptional detail and contrast and then a really soft defocused background. And so you can see here, um, you know, a different kind of image with the golf ball here, but you know, there's great detail, but depth of field is 
very shallow as you can see and the transition to background blur is nice uh, likewise here this is just an image i think that's really lovely both in the detail if you zoom in and look at the detail there but then also in the quality of the background blur uh, here's another that just kind of stood out yeah, to give you monochrome a different kind of look but again great contrast on the subject nice defocused background uh, even for you know a, a lens that's only 24 millimeters in focal length a few more that I enjoyed here, obviously co composing towards edge of the frame. So we can see that the contrast is not as exceptionally high here near the edge of the frame, but it's still a very usable amount. But it does give you a little bit, you know, bigger look at the bouquet quality, which really has fairly nice geometry everywhere you look and is nicely soft. Uh, here's another shot where, you know, it really kind of shows the potential of the soft rendering, you know, nice resolution on the subject and a nice transition to defocus. I also found that overall overall look of images when it comes to color and contrast was good. I've processed a little bit richer in color here, but I just thought that like the trunks of the trees, the colors that are captured there and the contrast looks really good uh, here, you know, where it's, it's it's more natural colors here, but everything is nice and rich, you know, good uh, color detail. And then here, a lone leaf that's going rogue and uh, turning in, in July, but it made for nice colors and you can see a nice you know uh, blend of the bokeh and the color rendition from the lens i was also impressed with the flare resistance of the lens in general and so here very intense uh, evening sun you can see that the um you know again we have a 11 bladed aperture and so the it's a kind of busy sunburst with 22 different blades coming off of it but at the same time i think that the blades are nicely defined and so the sun star does look good in general here you know very intense backlighting of this subject but contrast has held up well and of course you know good control of chromatic aberrations even in this extreme situation but flare resistance is good and here again you know we got a little bit of a ghosting artifact there but nothing that is ruining this image so a good strong result Finally, this lens, like the 20 millimeter, is being touted as a good option for astrophotography. Now, uh, I'll give the same caveat. It doesn't get particularly dark this time of year. I'm doing this review in later July and up north here. It doesn't get particularly dark even. This is after 10 p.m. And so... Um, but you can see that despite suboptimal conditions, there is a little bit of... Um, of coma where you see those kind of the star points are getting a little distorted towards the edge of the frame but overall in general it's really not too bad and you can see that as i pan around in general star points are nice and crisp uh, the low amount of vignette here helps with the image um, and so it makes for a, a good night sky maybe not as dramatic a focal length as the 20 millimeter but it still has that you know, you know, big maximum aperture sucks in a lot of light. And so I think it will be a tempting option for those that want to shoot astrophotography. And Sigma is certainly touting it as such. Bottom line is that when I got through looking at the images that I was getting from this particular lens, I just felt really positive about them. I felt like color rendition was really strong. I felt like the sharpness, real world optical performance was just really, really high. And images just had a great pop to them. It was a 24 millimeters is not necessarily a go-to focal length for me personally, but I did find that I really enjoyed using this lens out in the field. I really liked the kind of images I could get, get from it. I like the very low distortion, the well-controlled vignette, the great sharpness, three-dimensional quality, the color rendition, all of those things. Even the bokeh quality I thought was quite good. And as a byproduct, I think that this lens really does compete quite strongly with the G Master lens. Probably the only thing I would say that the G Master might still win is on a little bit softer bokeh blur, but it's very close as to be, I would think, probably pretty much indistinguishable. And at the end of the day, while this is a, a you know a pre-release lens that I've reviewed, and so Sigma has not finalized the pricing as of the day that I'm filming this review, they've given me a price range of where the price is going to fall. And I can tell by looking at that that very likely we're going to have a price point that is either right at the uh, around $900 price point of the existing lens, maybe just marginally higher by $50. But 
at either one of those price points, it's going to compete very favorably with the GM and undercut that price by probably somewhere near 500 US dollars. That makes this a very strong value. And now when you consider the fact that it really doesn't have any other limitations compared to the G Master, the size is roughly con comparable, the weight is just a little bit heavier, but not enough to make any kind of real world difference. It's got the weather sealing, it's got the full suite of, of features that actually exceeds the G Master at this point. This makes this a very compelling lens, and unless you absolutely have to have the G Master, I would say that this is probably the way to go. I'm Dustin Abbott, and if you look in the description down below, you can find linkage to my full text review where I break things down in detail. There's an image gallery if you want to see more photos from it. There are buying links there, but as always with these brand new releases like this where I'm basically re releasing my coverage at the same time that the announcement is being made, sometimes it takes a, a few days, maybe even a week or two for the retailers to catch up with their listing. And I would appreciate, as always, if you would come back and use my links to help to support this channel and to keep me doing what I'm doing. There's also linkage there to follow myself or Craig at social media, on social media, and you can check out our new channel, Let the Light in TV. You can find linkage to getting channel merchandise, becoming a patron, down in the description, of course, if you haven't already. Please click that subscribe button right here on YouTube. Thanks for watching. Have a great day, and let the light in.